So, thank you very much for joining. Um, here we are again, uh, beginning of the Bible study that we started before Christmas on John's Gospel and picking up actually where that finished. But if you've never listened to it before, you're very welcome. Uh, what I'm going to do today is actually really just do a little summary of what happened in a, a live discussion this afternoon uh, up at the church. Uh, it's very good to read the Bible together always, and perhaps this is really just a, a, a pale uh, imitation, but I hope certainly for you who are at home uh, listening for whatever reason, this might be a, a blessing to you. Uh, my name's Peter, I'm the minister in Calderbank and Cairnley Church, and we're reading in John's Gospel at chapter 8. Let's pray together before we begin. And so we come, Lord, to receive, to receive as we are together, Together in the power of your spirit, we pray. Together under your word. Together as would be followers of Christ. Or asking who he is. Or wondering whether we might follow. Hearing how he engaged that first audience around him. But how also his words carry into our times, into our place, into our homes, into our hearts. And so bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to take us through John chapter 8 and really up to verse 30, which gives us the title uh, picture for this week, that even as Jesus spoke, many put their faith in him. What we're doing in these Bible studies is reading just verse by verse or section by section, not missing anything out, but certainly not pretending that we can see everything within the short space of time about all the verses, but I hope giving food for thought. And always I would say, you know, please, by all means, come back to me with anything that you would like to speak about or ask about or email about. Uh, I'm very happy to, to have feedback. Let me bring up the text for you because that's maybe the easiest thing for us to, to do. So, uh, John chapter 8 begins with uh, a section quite well known, the woman caught in adultery and people trying to stone her, and Jesus asking her, really, well, what's happening here? Because he uh, tells uh, the one without sin to throw the first stone and the crowd melts away, and the woman uh, is left on her own with Jesus. And Jesus asks her to, to go now and to leave her life of sin. We're not told a huge amount what that was, uh, but certainly Jesus came into the world, comes into the world, we are sure, to make lives whole, to set us on a strong path not to rush into judgment or to condemnation, but rather to heal and to restore. Now, I did a whole Bible study in this section, not least because it's a slightly awkward uh, bit of the text in John chapter 8 uh, for all sorts of reasons. I'm not going to begin all of that again, but the video is still on the YouTube channel uh, of Kearney and Calderbank if you're interested to hear that. But on the back of those first 11 verses, we then get verse 12 and that's really where we're going to begin today. So let me just read it with you first. When Jesus spoke again to the people he said I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness 
is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, Where is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him, because his hour had not yet come. Well, that's the first half of what we're reading today. And let's just go back to the uh, the beginning first. Um, Jesus saying this very famous uh, bit of uh, uh, teaching, I am the light of the world. Now, at the end of chapter 7, the, the chapter before this one, we've heard that Jesus was at a feast, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, we're pretty sure, uh, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, a feast where there was not least a celebration that was around four great lights that were lit up in the temple because the sense always had been that God is the source of light. God had led his people through the wilderness by a pillar of cloud by day. His glory had filled the temple, the tent. Uh, uh, that was always a, a, a sense of what God was about, uh, the filler of light. And uh, uh, in the Bible, it's uh, for instance, in Psalm 119, we talk about the word of the Lord is a light to my path, a lamp to my feet. Or in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. So in the, in the whole way that people thought about faith in that world, and I think in ours too, light is good news. Light shines so that we will not fall, trip over, knock into things. Light shines so that the darkness will not take over, and the darkness can be a, a, a place where fears are, are, are born or fears are sustained. The darkness, people labouring under a dark cloud or, or being in a dark mood or in a dark place. Metaphorically, light is obviously good news, darkness clearly is not. And throughout John's Gospel, there is this contest between light and darkness, right from chapter 1. The light shines and the darkness has not overcome it. And this is Jesus. Jesus now saying, I am the light of the world. Well, I think we already have been uh, 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 ready to, to uh, think that, but here he is explicitly putting it. And it's very interesting in John's Gospel, at several points, Jesus puts into almost a very clear, simple sentence, things that are just absolutely precious for us to hold on to. But notice that he doesn't just say, I am the light of the world, as if, uh, uh, like, the, uh, like somebody on a stage, it's, he's singing, look at me, look at me, here I am, aren't I wonderful? That's not what being the light of the world is about. The light of the world has a function, has a role. In other words, immediately following him saying, he is the light of the world, he also says, follow me in order never to walk in darkness, in order for you also to have that light that will give you life. And that light which in you will bring life to others. So Jesus being the light of the world is the giver of something or someone whom we can follow, who will show us the way and who will lift us and banish the darkness. Now, we had a really rich discussion on that because that speaks to people in many different ways and I can't begin to really talk about how perhaps it's affecting you or how that can be sometimes a, a struggle for you or, or, or a joy for you. But I do encourage you just to treasure that thought. Jesus is the light of the world and to follow him is to have the light of life and to be walking away from the darkness, walking out of the darkness. Now, at the time and nowadays, there were people who said, oh, come on, uh, how are you so sure? Why should we believe you? The Pharisees at this point challenging Jesus, uh, well, it's just your words. I mean, where is that going? Jesus responds saying, well, yes, okay, it's me who's speaking to you. I'm saying this, absolutely, but I tell you, I know where I came from, I know where I'm going. 
and you just hadn't a clue. Jesus having a very acute sense of his, of his coming from God, of his very life, his whole calling being God infused, God saturated. You judge by human standards, says Jesus. You know, people who judge by human standards are deciding, well, do I like that person or do I not? Do I think that person is worth listening to or do I not? It's, it's all about what I think, yes? But for Jesus, no, he's not going to go there. He's not going to go on what he thinks about other people. Actually, he would have every reason to think quite a lot of, perhaps, negative things about other people. But he's not going to go there. I pass judgment and no one. That's what he means. I'm not going to spend all my time sizing up people to decide who's the worthy and who are the unworthy. Mind you, if I do judge, he says, I would be able to do it with truth because I'm not alone. I stand with the Father. God is, of course, ultimately the judge of us all. And PPS uh, in verse 17, he's already kind of uh, uh, modified slightly saying that he, he, he's not going to get into judging. But if I do get into judging, the Father's with me. And by the way, even if we're going to go by the law, which Pharisees were so uh, very pernickety about, uh, two witnesses are required. Well, Jesus says, there's me and there is the Father. So he's trying to respond to people who are saying, uh, who do you think you are? I mean, why, why, are, why are you offering this? Uh, and so that's where Jesus starts. And then he goes on, of course. Well, they ask him, where is your father? They, small f, they, they're not quite sure who he's talking about. Jesus replies, you do not know me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. To see the son is to see God, to love the Son, is to know, is to love the Father. Jesus was there for them. Jesus is there for us so that we might love God. Now, it's a lot to take in. It was a lot to take in then. John's Gospel tells us that Jesus at that time, he was speaking, you know, in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. There's this vivid memory. That's where those words were offered. Wow, thinking back. Eyewitness accounts, yes. But it wasn't the time that people arrested Jesus. That was going to happen, sadly. But his hour had not yet come. Yeah. Jesus does have a sense himself that the hour will come when he will be brought to trial, he will be crucified. But it wasn't at this point. We're just thinking back, remembering this precious teaching about him being the life of the world. Let's go on. Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin, for I go you cannot come. This is why the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Who are you? They asked. Let's just pause there a minute. Jesus, did you see in verse 21 once more? Uh, we, we had actually back in verse uh, 12, again, when Jesus spoke again, it's as if in John's Gospel there's these little sections, there are these very vivid memories of Jesus' teaching, and, and it wasn't just all at the very same moment. But these are sections that, as it were, belong together. It's, we, we've had an editorial process happening here, yes? Uh, the person writing the, the account, bringing things together, has, has thought, yeah, okay, that, that was that, and yes. And this belongs there. And maybe it wasn't the same day, not necessarily the same place, not even the same group of people listening, but yeah, let's just read this bit now. Read out this bit now. Because remember, this gospel was originally written really to be listened to, and to be, yeah, 
to in, be inspired by and to live your life by. And of course, nowadays here we are poring over the written text. So anyway, um, Jesus saying to people, I'm going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Now, I think that's quite important. I think almost certainly, just judging by the response that comes immediately in verse 22, Jesus is, is certainly talking about his, his death and his concern that if people don't believe in him, if people don't trust in who he truly is, then there is, there is in a sense, no way forward and certainly no ultimate way forward. To die in your sin, and it's singular, interesting, in verse 21, is really to die in unbelief. To die in the thought that, well, maybe there isn't a God, maybe there isn't a, a saviour, maybe Jesus was a, a charlatan, maybe Jesus told lies. Uh, this does not take us anywhere, says Jesus. Indeed, this is, a, this is literally a dead end. And... For him to say, where I go, you cannot come, is just to state the obvious. I mean, <coughs> you can hardly go with Jesus beyond death if you will not go with Jesus in life. Now, the Jews picked up that Jesus was speaking about death. And, yeah, interestingly, they do say, is he going to kill himself? Is that why you're saying uh, we, we can't go with him where, where he's going? Um, uh, they had no intention, of course, of... Them killing them, of killing themselves, even if they thought Jesus was going to kill himself. Well, Jesus wasn't going to kill himself. Jesus was going to ultimately yield himself to, to be arrested and, sadly, yes, to be crucified. But, no, he's not talking about suicide. No, he's not. So he needs to clarify for them because they're clearly not, not understanding. So he says, listen, you know, you are... You are from below, I am from above. Now, I think even though it's pretty plain speaking, we've got to recognise it as metaphorical speech, yes? So don't think of as it were, Jesus as being some ethereal, heavenly body. I mean, he is as much on the ground, as much flesh and blood as anybody else. But nevertheless, everything that makes him who he is, everything that shapes what he has to teach, is not as it were, learned from the bottom up, from, uh, well, at his mother's knee, just, or from the way that society thinks, just, or from uh, what it means to be a first century Jew in Palestine, just, even though all of those things clearly play into how he lived and, and how he spoke. But actually, really, his true authority, his true uh, identity is is heavenly. Now, heavenly is to say that it's of God, yes? You are of this world, I am not of this world. I am of the creator. You are of the created. There is a distinction. Now, goodness, it's hard for us sometimes to get our heads around this, even as, as, as signed up Christians. Uh, and it would be hard, actually. I was, we were talking in the Bible study earlier, how do people think about Jesus out on the street? Uh, it's quite tricky even sometimes to ask them, but, you know, for anybody to think of Jesus as the Son of God, to understand Jesus as the Messiah, the Chosen One, the Saviour of the world, it's, it's asking a lot, actually, of people. And yet, Jesus, at, when he was here, absolutely had to press those who were seeing him face to face. You know, there is no way forward in the way that is dominated by sin, where people are trapped by sin, where people are forever lying or being greedy or being unfaithful or uh, being caught up with, oh, all the kind of things that you and I just know so much about. That is just the way to, to death. The wages of sin is death, as Paul wrote to the Romans. So Jesus just doesn't want people to, to stick only with a this world life. He wants people to, to encounter the saving power of God that will bless life now and bless life into eternity.
And there in verse 24, it's a little bit hidden in the English translation. But he says, literally, if you do not believe that I am, you will indeed die in your sins. Now, at several points in John's Gospel, Jesus says, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the resurrection of the light, and so on. But here in verse 24, and then again at the end of this chapter 8 of John's Gospel, Jesus simply says that I am, he says. Now, uh, this has a bit of an illusion, a background to it, an allusion, not an illusion, an allusion. The background is partly Exodus 3, I'm sure, uh, where God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush. And Moses was told to go to the people of Israel and to say that I am had sent him, yes? Clearly the, that is in the background. But interestingly, in the ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible uh, that we have, in Exodus chapter 3, um, it isn't just quite this little Greek phrase that Jesus uses. Now, therefore the commentators have wondered, it isn't maybe just Exodus 3 that Jesus is himself referring to, or it wouldn't be just Exodus 3 that even his hostile listeners would be themselves thinking, what's Jesus doing here? It's also quite a number of passages in the book of the prophet Isaiah. And if you look in the prophet Isaiah, in really reading between chapters 40 and 48, you will see at several points, maybe six or seven points, the Lord saying, I am he, I am he. You'll, that's why you'll see in your English translations. But in the Greek, which, and we're reading Greek in, in, in John's Gospel, it literally says, ego I me, I am. Yes? So, sorry, this is maybe not interesting to you anyway, but anyway, there is a background here, a biblical background. Jesus is making a claim, I am, is a claim on Jesus' part to be, to be God to be God with them. So that is why in verse 25, I think with some taken abackness, with some startlement, with some astonishment, this group of people, whoever they are, say, who are you? Or they might have said it in an angry tone of voice, who are you, you know, to say this, or we don't know the tone of voice, we, we talked about that this afternoon, but they certainly picked up that Jesus didn't just say, if you do not believe that I am he, um, you know, that has nothing, uh, no baggage to it. It really has a very heavy resonance that the one who says I am is God. So how does it go on? Well, Jesus' first answer is to say, just what I have been telling you from the beginning, he replies. And then he goes on. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I have heard from him I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. So the first thing John's Gospel is remembering about this particular exchange is that Jesus really, in a sense, from the very beginning had been revealing that he was of God, with God, from the beginning, was God. I don't think it was now, in retrospect, such a surprise for him to, as it were, say it out loud, but this was a moment when he did say it. And just as people might have been reeling to take that on board, Jesus does talk about judgment. Now judgment has come up in the as well, the first section of what we read today. In fact it also of course is part of the story of the, the woman caught in adultery. But now 
I think we need to think about the 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 last judgment, the the grand judgment, when God on the last day will call his own to be with him forever. Jesus is making a grand claim that he will be there and he will be there, seated at the right hand. But for now, what he's wanting people to hear is that he is speaking from God and for God into the life of the world. This flesh and blood person that they were seeing then and there was speaking to them the very word of God. Now, did they get it? Well, sadly, no. Verse 27, they didn't understand that he was telling them about his father. I think actually, you can only have a bit of sympathy and understanding for them. I think it's quite hard. It must have been quite hard for them even to begin to wrap their heads around this. But Jesus did say a bit more. And what's remembered is that he said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, this human being that you see in front of you, this one who ultimately will be the judge seated at the right hand in glory, it's a, an, another allusion, allusion to Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man title, then you will know that I am, I am he, and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. In other words, he, he says uh, there will be a time when I am lifted up. Now, in John's Gospel, we know because, well, I've read it before, maybe you have as well. This is talking about the crucifixion. He is lifted up on the cross. That is the, the capital T, uh, H-E, moment of revelation. When the Father and the Son are joined. The Son giving his life for the life of the world. The Father allowing him to take on the penalty of sin. And then on the third day, Jesus is being raised from the dead, beyond where sin can reach, <laughs> beyond where grief can reach, beyond where there can be any tears anymore. Jesus will be raised. But for now, he's just saying, he's trying to get across, I am speaking for the Father. And, you know, Jews didn't know the Father could be a term for God. So when Jesus says, the one who sent me is with me, he has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. I suppose the more Jesus was speaking and the more people were seeing that he was a remarkable, a beyond remarkable human being in their midst. And his words did speak of God and for God. Well, as we're told in verse 30, even as he spoke at that point, even before he was crucified, even before he was raised again from the dead, many believed in him. And of course, this whole gospel is being written that people might have faith. We're being told without any question, of course, there were many people who struggled, who didn't get it at first, who maybe took quite a long time to, to get it, or maybe who never did get it. But there were people who were going to believe. There always have been people who are going to believe. And you and I, absolutely, we also are encouraged to believe. We'll continue next week. Let's pray. And so, Lord, you invite us to faith. Faith that you, Lord Jesus Christ, reveal the will of the Father. Live this life of God and for God on this earth. And so we are to listen, and not just to your words, but to your life. And not just with our ears, even, with our legs, our arms, our whole being, we are to follow. We are to be yours. We are not to die in our sins, but to be raised to a newness of life. 
to start even now, by your grace and through faith. Lord, hear us as we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.